Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to People Metrics Live. Today, we'll be reviewing two methods for measuring customer experience in pharma patient support programs. Uh, now, before we dive in, let's do some quick introductions. My name is Kirk. I've been an account manager here at People Metrics for a number of years and running a number of our pharma feedback programs. Uh, so I am here to share my expertise. And I'm joined by our CEO, Sean McDade, who I'll turn over for introduction. I think you just introduced me. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, spending some time with us today. Uh, some quick housekeeping before we get started. This session is being recorded and will be sent to your email later this week. So no need to take any notes. Just sit back and relax. And if you do have questions, the Q&A is at the bottom of your screen and will be open throughout mm -hmm. the session. So certainly feel free to drop in your questions uh, and we'll answer those at the end. For those of you joining, Welcome to People Metrics Live. We are reviewing those two methods for measuring customer experience in pharma patient support programs. Okay, so we talk a lot in these sessions about Pharma CX, which is creating experiences with intention, measuring how your customers feel about those experiences and managing that over time. Right. A lot of clients that come to us are only doing that first step of creating the experience. Right. Uh, now, for support teams that are ready to take that next step into measuring the experience they provide. Yeah. Uh, Sean, what, what are those things that they need to decide? Well, first of all, it, it makes sense. It's, it's such a li heavy lift to set up a patient support program, right? So you have to set up, you know, depending on how you're organizing it, if there's case managers and you're having, you're putting this, you're bringing this in house, you have to hire them, you know, put together processes, procedures, talk to the sales team about talking to HCPs about it being available to begin with putting notifications and getting getting patients to sign up, HCPs to sign up, it is a big and heavy lift. And if you have a digital part, which almost everybody does, you have to create that to supplement any kind of in-person or higher touch services you may be providing. So, you know, organizing this, if you're doing this in-house, or even if you're using a hub, you know, you have to keep an eye on everything that's going on. So sometimes people will do that. And, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, it's such, it's such a big, heavy lift. Yeah. Um, now measurement may come into into their thinking process. And I think what happens a lot of times is it's so, there's so many pieces you want to measure because there's, you know, you, you spend so much effort, you know, spinning up this patient support services team or program or technology or all of these things together that, you know, in our experience, people try to do too much too soon, right? So, you know, you can't measure everything all at once. That never works. It's not a good program. It's not a good experience for your patient, your customer, your HCP um, who may be using these services. Um, so really the theme of this, this uh, People Metrics Live session is simply, you know, start small and you'll get huge results on the back end. And yeah. it's counterintuitive, but it really does, it, you know, we mean it, it you know, just slip, you know, tackle a little sliver, you'll get so much out of it that your patient support program will improve. And then you can take on more and more of the full experience that your customer may have. Yeah, and I'd say a key reason for that, definitely when it comes to measuring the experience, a core part of making that valuable is getting buy-in from others mm -hmm. as to, you know, right. what's the purpose of this feedback. And getting that right. buy-in is hard to do when your initial ask is, do it all, you know, measure everything, measure every element, and then right. respond to every piece of feedback. That's a big ask. But if you can start with a single piece, show the purpose, you know, in one segment of your business, why we do this and why this process is important, then it's a lot easier to build and, sh and get establish that right. buy-in. So let me go through like two, I think, really good small measurement choices that you can start your patient support services measurement program with, right? So there, and we're going to go through the like different aspects of this in a second, but I just want to give a high level overview. So if you haven't done any measurement before, what we call a relationship survey approach is a really effective way to begin. And what that is, is you're going out to all of your customers, customers being patients and HCPs in this case, who may have interacted with your patient support program over a certain period of time. And what do we usually do, um, Kirk, six months, year these days? Like what, what are, what's the time frames that we're looking at? I, it's going to be different depending on kind of the, the, you know, how difficult the process is or how lengthy the process is rather than difficult to, mm -hmm. to, to achieve the medication. But yes, yeah, something within six months or a year, the important thing is they have some recent enough understanding of what your process is. Right. So they would have had an experience that they could have remembered and provided some sort of feedback on or experiences if it's multiple times, which probably it would be in, in that kind of your, your 
six months to year program. So the good part about that is you can get it started. You can get it in and out of, we call the field, meaning you, you can collect the feedback over a couple week period of time. You can get all of the feedback back. You can understand kind of what the overall experience is and you can disseminate the information across the organization in a time frame that you control. You meaning if you're an insights person who's in charge of this, or if you're a patient support services leader, whoever owns kind of this, maybe it's a collaborative effort between the two, right? So, you know, that's the great thing about relationship. It, you know, and you can have a separate one for HCPs as well as patients because they may have different experiences with your, your services, right? So that's one great option. The, the other option, and this is where I think people get in trouble, um, you know, we do a lot of what we call transactional work. And transactional work means we're gonna measure after a certain touch point or moment of truth. The moment of truth is something that, we've gone through this on people at Metrics Live before. Moments of truth are the most important interactions you have with your customers. Ones that if it goes poorly, they're gonna feel very, very bad. They're probably gonna tell a lot of people about it. They may not onboard, they may not adhere. It's that big a deal. But if it does go well, you know, they're gonna say how great it was and it's gonna influence them to probably onboard it here and do good things. So, you know, there's not that many moments of truth, but there's lots of touch points to potentially, right? And what the mistake I think people get into is instead of focusing on a moment of truth, they focus on, well, we touched the customer potentially eight or nine different ways or times or different circumstances. Let's measure them all now, mm -hmm. right? immediately after those experiences and a couple of things happen, right? Kirk, one, your customer, your patient in this case probably gets overwhelmed with too many surveys. Two, you don't know really what to do with that information because it's coming at you in, in eight or nine different directions. And that's when things kind of hit a wall and people get frustrated and, and don't get as much out of the program as I think they could. Yes, exactly. It is just juggling too much at once. And especially when you're going across multiple of these touch points uh, for, right. uh, for pharma, it could be for a support program that generally you're the owner of all those touch points, in which case, if you're getting all that feedback at once, it is just too much to manage when you're, you're starting off. And on the other hand, if, if you have multiple owners along you know, these different points of the path, suddenly yeah. you're having to communicate this information to different owners for this new process that they haven't heard of. And that's just, again, you're juggling too much. And so no matter how you cut it, you want to start you know, with something that you own that is small that you can get going and show and prove. Now, unlike relationship, which is a pretty standard process, like we, we would recommend pretty much the same process for everyone. It may be different time frame, Like you said, maybe it's six months, three months, year, depending on the type of medication but, and the type of services provided. But the thing about transactional is, you know, the, the client really needs to decide, the pharmaceutical company needs to decide what is that moment of truth? Although we've seen mm -hmm. one, we've seen ones that really are good starting points, right? That make, that are very meaningful. Um, yes, absolutely. Onboarding is generally a great place to start uh, yeah. regardless of, of your process, just because that tends to be, once a patient has onboarded to your medication, they've yeah. gone through kind of a number of steps and that's a good check-in point to see you know, how, how are you doing? What do we need to still resolve for you? And, and is the process going smoothly? Yeah, so. that's great. Um, and so let, that, that's, all, that's always a great place to begin, uh, you know, to get your program up and running with a critical, you know, moment. that is definitely a moment of truth, yeah. um, that process. Yes. And with that, should we jump to, you know, there are a yeah. number of differences between these two. So let's go let's, up and pull. Let's look. Yeah. We, we have something to show today, right? Yes, indeed. All right. And this is actually from my new book, um, Pharma Customer Experience, um, it's called. It's coming out in the fall. And this is actually a chapter, right? Chapter 11 or 12, I think, on chapter, how, 11, yeah. chapter 11, where we go through this in, in a lot of detail. This table is in there, but there's a lot more content. Um, so, right. So the first difference, right, is the objective. So the objective of relationship surveys typically is more strategic. It's Overall, how has our experience been for our customers, right? What are the best parts of that experience so that we can, you know, celebrate that and emulate that? What parts of the experience have not been great so we can look at that and try to fix it? You know, it can even, they can, there can even be a competitive component, right? Kirk, like if you've experienced other mm -hmm. patient support programs, 
how do they compare, especially HCPs who may have may have uh, experience with many, um, and and how do you stack up? Exactly that, and that generally fits. Of course, you're asking about competitors because it is strategic. You want to know holistically, you know, broadly. We have a program that uh, delivers a range of services. Are we doing the? Are we delivering the right services? Are we delivering them as we expect we should? And it is a, a broad based something that uh, you should take back to an executive team. Uh, as opposed exactly. to, oops, sorry, yes. So, so certainly for a transactional survey, that is intended to be more tactile because since it happens immediately after an interaction, things like that are going to be top of mind for a patient uh, or HEPs, things that they couldn't remember in a strategic survey of if you just had an interaction, you're going to remember something about that rep about that phone call that you wouldn't say if I survey you once a year. Right. Like just pr a practical ex example, you know, a patient of yours calls into a contact center, they get their case manager, they're talking about certain pieces of their, you know, onboarding process. You know, you could be surveying them immediately after that phone call, right? Mm -hmm. How did that go? Right. Mm -hmm. So this is a continuous, and I think we have that as a, as a dimension to it. This is, this is something that goes on all the time where relationship is a point in time. Is that the next one? That is indeed. Yeah, so let me just go into this a little bit. So relationship surveys are a set point in time. Like we said, usually it's out, we're collecting feedback for a couple of weeks um, and then it's done for the year. And we recommend that typically these be done once a year. It's good to reach out to all of your customers, patients, HCPs once a year at least. You get to compare overall what the experience is like compared to last year or the year before. Um, you know, people metrics has benchmarks on kind of how they, you would compare to other companies around the overall experience. So you could, you could look at that. It's really a great thing to do once a year, but it is once a year. It doesn't happen all the time. Typically there's a, you know, analysis and report presentation that goes into that where transactional is very, very different. Like the example I was just giving you, um, you know, you, if, if you felt like the call with the case manager was the, the key thing you wanted to measure and you wanted to get that feedback immediately after that call, you'd be getting that feedback all year round, right? And it's an ongoing stream of data. Um, and the reason why you want it that way is you wanna be able to follow up and, and course correct if needed, if, if the experience isn't right. And we can we'll talk about that in a second, but um, it is an ongoing piece of, of work that, that sort of never turns off. Yeah, and I think just the only other thing I'd add here is that generally what we recommend for surveys timing-wise is you want to measure, take some action, and then measure again. So with relationship right. surveys, that's why it's once a year is because commonly within pharma companies, you're not going to be able to create some organizational shift where something strategically is going to change more often than that. Uh, and then, of course, with transactional surveys, as Sean was saying, you want to take action on that right away. So your measure and then action is following up with the customer if they have a bad experience. That That is an ongoing following up and taking action all the time. Absolutely. Okay, so on to our next one here. Right, so this is a huge difference too. Um, relationship surveys are longer. Uh, you know, you're getting, you're, you're able to ask questions about every possible part of the experience, all of the touch points that I mentioned that you could be measuring you know, in a transactional survey, but probably shouldn't be on a continuous basis, but you can get, you can dive deep into it and it can be 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and it's something that may take a little bit of time. Transactional surveys really should be short. I mean, e under five minutes, five minutes would be the most better transactional surveys are a couple minutes long. You're in and out. You're asking about that specific experience. You're, you're, you're asking how it was, was there a problem? What was the problem? Did this person do a good job? What did they do? And you're done. Like you're really in and out. And the reason for that is, you know, you're asking about a far shorter, a far smaller amount of experiential kind of data there, right, Kirk? So there's no mm -hmm. reason to ask to to ask 15 minutes worth of questions on certain touch points. Exactly. If if you haven't gotten the answers you need in five minutes, you're not going to get it in six for a a, a, a transactional survey. So you, you'll, you'll get what you need in, in under that time. Uh, and, and I think the, the last thing I would note on the length is that, of course, you may, if you're working with other stakeholders, everyone wants to add their own questions. This is a, These are good bounds. If you start going for 20 minutes, 30 minutes on these surveys or over five minutes for a transaction survey, you're going to take hits to your response rate and that's going to harm the... Right. The, the amount of work you can do with the results. Yes. Oh, okay. 
Next up. Right. So I think I may have mentioned this before. When you do a relationship survey, it's in the field for a couple of weeks. You're going to get a lot of responses back in a short period of time. Right. Yeah. You know, you could and, you know, we get response rates right in the in the 20s a lot of times for these um, for all of these. But so just imagine what you'd be getting. Exactly. Yeah. Around 20 to 30 percent for across transactional and relationship surveys. And so you'll get that all right away uh, as opposed to kind of building that up over time for transaction survey. So the volume of response will be a lot. And then on transactional surveys, they just simply won't be a lot in the beginning because you're honing in on a single touch point. So you got to let enough customers, patients, HCPs flow through that touch point in order for you to get a meaningful amount of data to look aggregately. But like we said, the tactical nature of it means that even one person who has a poor experience is enough for you to take some action on it. Right, so this gets into the length, right? So. Um, if, if you're, if you're encroaching on that 15 minute mark or maybe more, you know, honorary is probably in the cards, especially with HCPs, if there's an HCP version of this, um, with transactional, there's never, I, mean, I don't think we've ever done an honorary for a transaction. We have not, no. Uh, so. And that's HCPs, that's patients. And the key is it being, being short, right? So if you start, if you, if you don't make those short, then you will need to have an honorary. Yes, that, yeah, and I think that's exactly right. It's short, so you don't need it. The good thing about these surveys is generally patients and HCPs want to give feedback on their support programs. So you're going to get a good response rate if you design a good survey. Without a doubt. Better than you probably think. And if you use people metrics, it would be higher than you would think. That's right. I'm just going to have a shameless plug for us. We do get good response <laughs> rates. There is a, there's been a people metrics live on this topic on how to get high response rates. It's, yeah. it's going to be in the YouTube playlist. Yeah, huh. All right. Okay, so, and I, I think we've mentioned this, but it's worth mentioning again. So when you do a strategic survey, you're covering every touch point that you basically had with your customer, right? So you don't have to choose because you have more time. You wanna give, an, the, the purpose is strategic. You wanna understand the overall relationship and you wanna identify those that are performing well and those that aren't, those touch points. But with, with a transactional, it's really best to hone in on one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to really split your patients or your HCP's attention when it's something that, you know, a transaction just happened, focus on that, focus on what just happened. That's what you want to learn more about. Yep. Okay. Competitor questions. This was mentioned too before. You can have competitor questions in a relationship survey, especially with HCPs around the different support programs they make, they might be looking into and offering and getting, having experience with, right? Mm -hmm. But with, and that hence makes it a longer survey for sure. But transactional surveys, you'd never ask that. You want, it's again, it's quick, it's short. And it doesn't mean that it isn't valuable. Some would argue it is more valuable, right? Some would argue that understanding specific patients and HCPs who had poor experiences and knowing what those were and why those happened in real time. So they can, you can either fix that individual experience or future experiences immediately is worth everything. And I, I'm one of those. I, I, I'm a big believer in transactional. If I was running a patient support program, I might even start there, but I'd always do a relationship too. Without a doubt. All right. So we have follow up. Kirk, you're, you're, you're big into follow up. Why don't you take this one? Absolutely happy to take it. So, mm -hmm. as far as what do you do when you get the data with transactional surveys? you always want to follow up with the customer. Well, certainly if there's something that's gone wrong, you, you need yeah. to follow up with that. You need to correct that issue. That's the purpose of these surveys is to correct in real time. And what we find uh, is that uh, when patients have a better or more satisfied with the experience they have with their support program, they are more likely to onboard, they are more likely to adhere. So these yeah. transactional survey follow-ups make sure that patients and HCPs have a successful experience where the patients get therapy. With relationship surveys, that is less common. You certainly can follow up if someone has a very negative experience that they indicate in a relationship survey. However, it tends to be that they might be removed from that experience. So the need, the necessity to correct something, that, that time may have passed. So, it, But it is essential. If you're not but, doing that for transaction survey, you're just missing the point. Listen, if you shouldn't follow up on relationship surveys unless the, sur the experience was really recent. Like it's weird and odd and not best practice to follow up on something that happened many months ago. So you really wouldn't want to do that. Mm 
Um, but with transactional, you absolutely should. And we should do a people metrics live on how that works in pharma because in other industries, it's a little bit more straightforward where you can just basically follow up. You can have an alert with all this information, but obviously with all sorts of uh, you know regulatory pieces of pharma, you can't share that information as freely, but there still is way are ways to, to with the right people to follow up with, with patients, HCPs that had a poor experience. Maybe we'll save that for another people metrics live in the That's future. Good topic. Yeah. yeah. And we have just one last one uh, yep. to cover here. Just the access. Right, right. So it, it, I'll take this one, the, the organizational access to the results. So with relationship surveys, it's really up to the sponsor who gets to see the results, right? We, we would offer it on our platform in real time to anyone who has access, but usually that's the sponsor when we're doing relationship surveys. And they may present it to, you know, brand teams or may present it to certainly the patient support teams see it. Um, but with transactional, since the data is rolling in in real time continuously, you can give access to your whole team. You can give it to case managers if you have them. You can give them to you know, your insights team on the market research side. You know, the, the patient support services leader would have access to this. Um, anyone else that you think would benefit from understanding how your customer experience was in real time you know, you can give access to that because A, it's timely. There's new data rolling in every day, literally. And, you know, there's action to be taken on it at times. So it's super, super relevant to get, have extensive access to the results. Yeah. And, and that's really key. Ultimately, it all ties back to the purpose where for making strategic decisions in the organization, there's a few people who make those choices and need to see that data. But for the tactical interacting with your customers, everyone is responsible for that. And you want everyone to understand how we can better serve our customers. Yeah. And that is uh, everything that we've got. I think uh, those are those are all the key points that we have. I think we're just about at time here, Sean. So, yep. so any last thoughts or... No, that, you know, I'm excited to share this chapter with people um, when, when the book's out, but I think, I think this, this table will be available sooner, right? They'll, it'll be something Absolutely. that people can download. This will be available as a download. So yeah. uh, definitely, I want to say, you know, Sean, thank you. This has been an awesome overview of kind of these two yeah. key methods for measuring the experience. We hope this has been a valuable conversation for everyone we've got online and we'll uh, make sure uh, that we will include a link to download this once this is up on the YouTube channel so you can think about this and as a reference when you start your session. Uh, if you do have any colleagues or friends who couldn't make it to this session of People Metrics Live, no worries. You can always find these previous recordings on our YouTube channel. And you'll also find links there to sign up for future sessions of People Metrics Live. You can explore our blog, get copies of our founder of Sean's books, Listen or Die, which is available on Amazon and Pharma Customer Experience, which is coming out this fall. And finally, if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you uh, about what you're working on and give you a tour of our experience management platform where you can also you know, find links in our YouTube channel on our website. So thank you again for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. And we love, hope to see you again soon for another edition of People Metrics Live. Thank all you. Bye-bye, right. all.